disc, a physical object, take it home, put it in my, in my machine, and play it. And when I was done with it, I could trade it to a friend. But you know, basically, once I didn't have it in my possession anymore, it was gone, right? Um, about 10 years ago, games like World of Warcraft, right, Sheldon and his battle ostrich, um, they went massively online. And so this, in this business model, they still sold you a client right, for $50. But then you had to pay an additional like $8 to $12 a month to subscribe to be able to access the servers. And um, this was actually an interesting business model, and I, I love World of Warcraft because for the first time I could play not just with a friend on a couch, right, or just somebody I could link directly my machine to like I used to with my computer. I could literally play with thousands of people simultaneously, right? Um, now, of course, the, the big deal are, is the smartphone, right? Um, for the first time ever, you know, we're all carrying around in our pockets a computer that is, you know, much more powerful than even desktops of, you know, not too long ago. And, you know, you ask most people, what's the very first thing, and actually studies have been done, what's the first thing that people download on the smartphone usually is a game. And the, 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 there's a, basically a gold rush going on into mobile gaming. And you know most of those games, at least the ones that are always at the top of the top grossing, sort of paradoxically, are free to play, meaning that they're absolutely free to download. Um, but you know, they monetize by giving players the option to buy small things through microtransactions as people play. right? And this business model relies not on just getting the, the game on somebody's phone, but hooking people and making such a fun game that they keep playing over time as they introduce new uh, features and new ways to monetize. And these games, you know, if you watched the Super Bowl last year, right, you saw ads for like Game of War and Clash of Clans on the Super Bowl, sort of like, you know, the holy grail of advertising. Um, so that's sort of how big these games have gotten. Um, and of course, they're desperate to attract players because, unfortunately, just like the Atari <coughs> in the 80s, uh, if you've been in the app stores lately, you'll see that almost every game kind of looks like every other game. Um, and it's getting harder and harder and harder to differentiate them uh, themselves from their competition. So what actually tends to happen is you get some giant mammoth games like these guys, um, and then you get a whole host of others who are just barely eking by, um, hoping that they can be kind of the next big thing. Um, and so, well, so where does fraud come into that, and why does that affect that, right? So. This model is so profitable for the online game industry that just online games, so this is a stat that not a lot of people know, um, Super Data Research published their annual review of sort of like how much you know, games made. Just online games, so not the ones you go to GameStop and buy for your Xbox or your PlayStation, just literally the ones that you just download to Steam or to phones, generated $63 billion with a B in 2015. Now, to give you an idea of how big that is, um, you know, the worldwide take for Hollywood movies, you know, Avengers, all these big movies, was only like about $38 billion. So, you know, just about twice as much, you know, went into games. A lot of them went into games like Clash of Clans, right? But a lot of it was distributed against, you know, thousands of other smaller games, uh, you know, and a lot of them were generated uh, through free-to-play. Uh, in fact, one publisher, um, uh, Electronic Arts, uh, reported that just online sales for their traditional games generated 1.3 billion for them last year. So it's very, very profitable. It's it's easy for people. It's frictionless. You know, people want to you know are able to do it on their phones pretty easily. And what I know from uh, when I was in banking is that fraudsters always follow the money towards wherever it is. Um, they don't care where it is. They're not gamers. They're not wizards. Uh, they're just business guys, right? And if you think about it. Uh, and I can absolutely say this is true. Uh, you know, think about games versus banks. Um, they are—they're not regulated for the most part, right? They don't have to, to report to the FBI or to the FFIC like banks do. Um, you know, a lot of times, you know, stealing things in games is not even a crime. It's just a terms of service violation, right? And so what that means is that a lot of these bad guys who have refined tools. Uh, like Steam Stealer for other industries, like online banking, are just able to retask them into games. Uh, and you know, it was definitely true in banking. It's true in e-commerce. You know, now of course this is happening in video games in a big, big way. And this is sort of why. So this is actually a, a, a screenshot from Kaspersky's report. Um, if you haven't read it, it's actually pretty fascinating. Um, I mean, look at the item prices. These are just virtual items that dropped at random in a game, in a game called Counter-Strike Global Offensive. It's sort of like their big game, right? These are actually pretty affordable items, and they're like 400 bucks a piece, right? So that's what they're going for on the open market. So you know, you'll, people will get one of these, they'll sell it to somebody on an unauthorized third-party site for real money, 
and then they'll use the Steam trading system to, to, to trade it over. But you know, now, of course, account takeover is so rampant. This is why. Because people have these items in their accounts, and you know, now people are taking those credentials and they're seeing them, and if they're there, they strip them out, and they send it. It's just like basically kicking down your front door, stealing something of value, and then you know, fencing it out to somebody else. And that's why this is so rampant right now, is because of these prices. And I'll tell you, these are pretty cheap compared to some of the high end, the very rare items that can go for multiple thousands of dollars on the open market. And it's been that way for a couple of years now, which is why 77,000 accounts are being hacked. But there is more than account takeover going on. So you know, there are scams like gold farming where people will actually just kind of like gather mundane virtual resources. So you know, like uh, Sheldon was saying that they stole all my gold, right? Well, you know, you accumulate that over time. It's worth things because you can trade it, you know, for other virtual items in the game. And so you know, if you've got a lot of it bankrolled in, it's just like any other virtual currency. You know, it has value, real world value. It can be stripped out. There are people who have figured out ways to, you know, multi-box the game, so they'll run, you know, hundreds of versions of the client, uh, special custom versions of it. They don't even need to play the game; they just have bots playing for them. They they uh, accumulate these things. I'm going to talk about one scheme we actually found that was worth a, a huge amount of money that that used a version of this. Um, and then, of course, some of these guys actually are you know, straight up criminals, right? So if you have a card that's stored on your account, which a lot of people do or have to. Uh, they can misuse that card to purchase those items from the store, uh, the in-game store, sell them for a fraction of their cost on the gray market. I mean, why not, right? They're not losing any money. It wasn't theirs to begin with, right? Uh, all that's going to happen is that, you know, whenever the, the credit card holder notices that charge, they're going to say, you know what, I didn't authorize that, and then who's going to get hurt is the game publisher, because they're going to have those funds clawed back. So. What's needed on this then? So when, we, when I first started the company, um, we were in an accelerator here in Columbus, Ohio, 10 Accelerator down at Tech Columbus, which is now Rev1. And we spent that time uh, building our prototype, and, we, and I spent the time mainly talking to game publishers. I had some contacts in the industry. And so I talked to about 50 of them on different sizes, and I asked them, you know, well, you know, what are you doing now? Um, what's working for you well, and what's not working for you well. And I was trying to find out sort of what they really needed, okay? And so, um, you know, and they were actually very, very open to me. Compared to, like, talking to bank executives, um, they were incredibly open, and they gave me a lot of really good information. Um, so, you know, what they basically told me was that they tried all the traditional stuff. So they tried multi-factor, IPGO, black white listing, challenge questions, etc. They tried all those things. Um, and what's interesting is a lot of these solutions, I actually recognize the people who are, who are distributing them, it's because they're originally designed in banking, but they lost effectiveness in banking because the malware evolved to the point that they could actually make an entry <coughs> around these things. And so banks stopped using them. So a lot of them rebranded themselves as gaming solutions. Um, and now they're moving towards games. And they're actually, some of them work for a while because from what we're seeing, you know, the, the kind of people that mass attack games are fundamentally incredibly lazy compared to the kind of people that attack banks. They're not bothering to spoof their IPs. They're not bothering to use sophisticated attacks. One of the things that Kaspersky said a lot about Steam Stealer is that it's so primitive compared to what we've seen in the past. But it, 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 it can do that because it still works. Because there's not the kind of countermeasures in place in online games. Um, that you know, we've seen in banks. And it kind of makes sense, right? Because these are people that want to make games. They don't want to make security products. So a lot of times they bolt the stuff on at the end, um, and only usually after they have an attack. So a lot of times they can get away with doing stuff that would never fly in other industries. Um, and, and this is this, this bottom quote is, is my favorite one. And some guy just said this to me. It's great. He's like, you know, well, you know, this is somebody that actually tried almost all these very large public. He said, well, the problem with using bank tools to secure my games is that, you know, the bad guys have had years to figure out how to defeat them. And, that, and they absolutely do. Um, different types of games have different problems as well. So, for example, an MMO like, like World of Warcraft that Sheldon was playing, account takeover is still a huge thing. Makes sense, right? It's a, there's a high barrier of entry to get into those games, and it takes a lot to build up a lot of the resources um, that are worth stealing in those accounts. But you know, free-to-play games are you know, all about account reselling. So you know, people can actually level up the accounts automatically and then just sell the whole account uh, you know, with you know, top level and with items in it for real money. That's a, that's a loss for the publisher because they were hoping that you play over time and then pay them for your, your cost or your time saving things if you needed them. Uh, and of course, gray markets, you know, all of the things that they generate. Because if you ban a free-to-play account, right, it's just going to come right back because they're just going to make a new one. Uh, it, it's you know there's no it's like they have to buy the client again and it's, it's expensive for them to get back in. 
Social casinos, so these are casinos, games that you cannot cash your chips out from at the end, so you purely play for fun. We'll talk a little bit more about those in a minute. Um, it's mainly about cheating and collusion, so that's when players will uh, be, you know, kind of cheat on together, or they'll play together on purpose against the rules, you know, to try and, like, you know, win. Uh, and then real money casino, though, that's a whole different thing. Uh, because in a real money casino, you can cash your chips out at the end. And those guys have a huge issue, not only with cheating and collusion because the people who are trying to enrich themselves, but uh, they're being used for money laundering and cybercrime, which totally makes sense if you think about it, right? You can you know, buy in to a real money casino game and then lose all your money to another player, and now you've got a paper trail for where that money goes you know, as the income into the other person. You've effectively laundered it to somebody else, and that's really kind of money laundering 101. <coughs> Everyone we talked to about what they're doing to fix this said, well, mainly what we do is we make rules-based reports. So if they don't have logging turned on on their games, they usually hurry to turn it on. Um, and then they basically do forensics. They say, okay, well, what's hit us in the past? They create some rules to figure out what this is, and then they, and then they add those rules, and then they run reports, right? And this is actually interesting because this is what got me into to making the company is, is that banks did the exact same thing 10 years ago. Everyone tried to figure out their own solutions. They figured, we got smart people, we know our customers, we should be able to do this. Um, problem with, um, with reports, though, is that they're very expensive. Uh, if anybody works with reports for a living, like, like I did for many years, uh, you know that they're incredibly expensive to, to not only write but maintain over time, especially when you have motivated people who change their behavior to avoid the rules. And because a rules-based system can be observed, by bad guys, right? So in other words, what they were doing yesterday suddenly stops working, so they know, oh, they're on to me. So they'll start to change their behavior up until it starts working again. Now they've triangulated on what the rule is that's, that's stopping them. And so now the, the rule has to be adjusted. And we hear over and over and over again, yeah, I've had suggested changes to my rules engine in for the last month or two, but it always gets getting pushed to the bottom because there's always other IT things that are more important that need to be done. And while that's happening, the rules are effectively blind and, and useless to what's going on in the game. Um, everyone we talked to agreed that you know, these, these bad actors are from all over. They're constantly looking for advantage. Um, they all acknowledge that this is a huge problem, but they're not really sure how to fix it. And the most important thing is that really it's more than about the money um, because you know, the damage that's done to the game, if you think about it, if, you're, if they want you to play over time, but, you know, the game's no longer fun for you, uh, you're going to leave, and, you know, there's a stat that, you know, I'm sure you've heard this, if you're, if you're satisfied with something, you're going to tell, like, two people, but if you're dissatisfied, you're going to tell, tell ten, right? Well, that's true in games, especially for a bunch of wired community, connected community. If you go into a game and it's full of just nothing but a bunch of Chinese gold farming robots, you're going to tell people, yeah, that game's not fun anymore, it's just, it's, there's nothing there for me, right? And so they're really worried about the reputational damage, and the reason why is because even very, very large studios are finding out with a lot of hits under their belts that, you know, reputation is pretty much all you've got, especially if you're a new developer, right? Uh, if you leave a bad taste in a player's mouth, they're going to remember that. And, you know, this is actually focused for developers, not for publishers, this article. Um, and he was warning them that, you know, hey, you know, you, this has to be important you because as a studio, you know, your name is on the game. People are going to remember. And if your publisher, and what his point was in the article was, if your publisher doesn't help keep your games secure, or make your games fun, or do the right things, it's going to hurt you. Because your next game, who knows who you're going to publish through. All you've really got is your reputation. And it makes it much, much harder, especially in a very crowded market like this, to get an edge you know, if you've got a bad reputation with the players that they're servicing. So I want to actually now talk about a specific case study that we did for a, a very large game publisher where we actually found some very interesting statistics about what this actually costs publishers uh, and what's actually going on in the space. So the, the game that we did a, a very large project for, and we just ended it, was a social casino game. I can't say who, unfortunately. I'd love to be able to, but I can't, uh, and I understand why. Uh, if, I can't say who, but if you've played games on Facebook or if you've played games on a mobile phone, I'm, you probably statistically chance to have one of their games on your phone. The game that we, mar that we actually studied was a very large game for them. It was a social casino game, specifically a poker game. Uh, and again, this was not a real money game. So at the end of the day, 
Um, they could not cash out their chips. But really what they're selling is the fantasy of, you know, they can, you can, in that game, you can buy $100 worth of virtual chips, right? Um, but really, that $100 translates to like a million dollars in chips, right? And so what they're selling is the fantasy of, you know, going all in at a no limit, you know, Texas Hold'em poker table, uh, you know, and, and that thrill that you get of like, you know, putting a million bucks on the line, even though it really didn't cost you that much. Um, now that's great if you win, but if you lose, the way that our customer, you know, made their money is they sell you more of these virtual chips, uh, you know, through their approved item store. And actually, it's a great thing for them. They're making a lot of money at it. They had a, uh, about 13 and a half million players, um, and they were making hundreds of thousands of dollars every single month just purely on selling these virtual assets to their players. Um, now, what's interesting is that half of them were, half of the people we model were connecting through mobile, half of them were connecting through Facebook, the sub of our strong Facebook. And so that means that they get the advantage of, you know, Facebook has pretty strong authentication tools, they have multi-factor authentication, you know, on, on the application. Um, they also, you know, the app itself was in the curated app store, and we were we 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 proved beyond a shadow of a doubt that the uh, the bad guys that were in their games were not using hacked clients. So I mean, this was purely a straight up, you know, commercial version of. So there no hacking was involved at all, right? Um, and on the back end, they had you know the most expensive, best transaction level security they could get from their credit card provider. So they basically, you think that they had everything set. Right? They also were very data centric. So it wasn't like a lot of the customers we worked with where they didn't even have analytics turned on or they didn't have logs turned on. This was a company that was founded on the principle that kind of like data is king. So they had, you know, big data science teams that were looking at this. You'd think that they had everything perfect, right? But they engaged us because they knew they had this problem because when you searched for buy cheap poker chips with their name on it, you actually didn't see their a uh, listing for their item store until like page seven on Google. Everything else was gray market unauthorized sites that were selling the chips for a fraction of the cost. So they knew they had a really big problem, they didn't know what it was costing them. And so basically um, they, they responded to this by having people manually monitor the play. So they literally were looking at playbacks of what was going on, hoping that something would trigger their spider sense, that they would know, okay, yeah, that guy's not playing right. Um, and they had people following, you know, the sun around the world looking at this. I even don't want to know what that cost them to, like, basically kind of manually monitor this content. They also had some rules-based reports. Same thing. They knew that other uh, schemes had hit them. They did forensics. They took them apart. Um, but every time they put something in, they, they saw not only that, that these sites not go away, but their prices didn't even go down. So they weren't even making an impact on the gray market cost of acquisition that would lead them to raise their prices down the way. So they asked us to take a look and see what was going on. Um, and what we found was, you know, we, we started by modeling 100% of all their player data for 90 days. So we, we start by, you know, we don't use any rules. We use pure mathematical analytics. We need to start by monitoring everybody, creating a pattern of what's like normal good behavior. And then, you know, look for the bad guys. Our first pass, we found the bad guys with about an 88% accuracy rate. We tuned the models, and then we came back with about a, almost a 99% accuracy rate for these gray market. Uh, actors, and there were thousands and thousands of them. Um, at the end, really what that translated to, when you looked at the sheer volume of chips that were being sold on the gray market versus what they were selling, is they were losing about 40% of their revenue opportunity. So in other words, for every dollar that they sold in their store, another 40 cents was being sold completely outside the game that they got no benefit from. Um, and that was a sobering number. Uh, and it's bad enough when you're a very, very large company and you can absorb that, but I can tell you that most of our customers no, 40% is like the difference between life and death. I mean, if you ever owned a business, think about trying to operate with 40% of your revenue, not your profits, your revenue, falling out the bottom. Um, and what's really interesting about this number is when I first started talking to all these publishers, and I asked them, you know, okay, well, what is this costing you? They all acknowledge it's a problem, right? Well, what's the problem costing you? No one could tell me for sure because they didn't have the tools to study it. But when I pressed long enough, people would finally start to tell me kind of in a quiet voice, it's like, well, I think it might be as much as half. And the first time I heard that number, I thought, these guys are insane, right? You cannot run a business losing half of your revenue. But I kept hearing the number, the more people <coughs> talked to me. I couldn't prove it, but that's what kept them up at night, was that it could be as much as half. And then the first study that we did, you know, really dig into a large gray market, that's the number we got. So I think these guys really are onto something 
Um, I think it's the kind of the problem, though, where you know, you've got a bathtub, right? And there's a hole in the bottom of the bathtub, right? Right now, there's tons of water coming in the top of the bathtub because everybody's, like, getting into gaming. They're downloading things on their phones like mad. And so if there's a hole in the bottom of the bathtub, nobody cares, right? Because there's more water coming in the top. And so everybody's happy. But eventually, that's going to change. And when that changes, and as it changed with our customer when their game started to kind of lose popularity, suddenly that hole in the bottom, that 40% revenue loss, starts to become really, really huge. And for a lot of smaller companies that never reach that point where they're just like got that floodgate of players, um, you know, if you've you know gone in and financed your game, you know, with VC money or with investors, and you know, it took you two million bucks to make your game, and you spent another ten million bucks to market your game, which is actually like actual numbers of what the ratio is of development cost to customer acquisition cost, you're expecting to monetize that back, um, you know, over like you know, say twenty four to thirty six months, but your game is dead in six because it got strip mined by bad guys. You know, good luck trying to get finance for your next game. And that hurts everybody. That's why when I say it's a cancer, that's what I mean. Because it not only affects the games that are out now, it affects all the games that are coming up behind them. Because it's going to be harder and harder and harder, especially for smaller and mid-sized studios, to be able to make them. You know, because they won't have the financials that they need to be able to make a good business case that they should be allowed the opportunity to build them. So... The recommendations that we have, and these are sort of like the recommendations that I would also make for you guys as security professionals, if you're ever tasked with protecting one of these types of organizations, would be, you know, think like a bank, because that's what the bad guys think like. These are locked up assets that have real world value that are basically untraceable the minute that they're taken out. So they're the perfect virtual currency for fraud, okay? And there's no law enforcement agency I know of that wants to talk about this. Um, I tried to talk to our keynote speaker, right? Like, well, what's the FBI care about this? And he gave me this blank look. Like, uh, I mean, I, I know from banking that, you know, banks have to report all these financial crimes to the FBI every single time they happen. Only a tiny fraction of them ever get looked at. And only the big ones that they want to make, make an example out of. So the guys, you know, especially if they're overseas in, company, in countries where there's really no, like, strong laws about this, they don't care about going after banks a lot of the time. So what do they care if, if they go after a game, right? So if you're a security professional and you're thinking about this, think like, you know, you're a bank. Use layered security. You know, yeah, you're going to put, you're going to need to put strong front locks on the front door. And that's what probably everybody in this room does for a living, right? But expect that people are going to get past that, right? And think about, you know, how am I going to study what people do if the bad guys and when the bad guys get past my outer defenses? What are they going to, what are they doing inside the environment to damage it, right? Also, make sure you're measuring the right things, you know, because just because your customer tells you, well, you know, well, you know, fraud happens because X, Y, and Z, that doesn't necessarily mean that's true. That might be some of it, but there actually could be, just like with our customer, it'd be a lot more of it that they did not know about that they're blind to. And so be very careful of, of your measuring the right things and be skeptical, you know, of your initial results. You tune your models and make sure that you're actually trying, you're finding everything. Look, look for anomalies, look for things that are strange. Um, and then, you know, study those very, very carefully. Um, start measuring super early, as early as possible. I recommend that games uh, start measuring things while they're still in their beta period, right? Because we see tons of evidence that the bad guys build their tools in beta. I don't know if anybody has been involved with uh, a beta, so a pre-release version of a game, but a lot of uh, publishers use these as marketing tools now to try and, like, get buzz out. It's basically the, the full release of the game. They're really not, you know, beta testing it. They're just sort of, like, early releasing it. And so the bad guys sign up for these betas, and they build their tools in the beta because on release day, that's when most people statistically spend money, especially in a free-to-play game, because they're the most excited and they want to be part of something. And that's when the bad guys absolutely want to have all those tools in place. And then if it's a game that's already running, just assume that the bad guys are in there and that they're, at, and they're operating. You know, uh, and and you know, kind of figure out what they're doing now already you know, with the advantage that they've got. Um, if I, I'm a big proponent of analytics. Uh, uh, this is huge in free-to-play, especially for market segmentation, because they're trying to figure out how to monetize these games. Um, so a lot of those guys are studying what, we, what I call good events, right? They're still trying to figure out, like, okay, this is a free event player that's about to monetize, whether it is monetize but could monetize again, or the one that's going to monetize real big, you know, what they call a whale, right? Um, but almost nobody is studying bad events. They're not studying the friction that throws people out of a game, that kills a player early. They all fear something called churn, right? Like how long it takes a customer to normally come in, but then go out again. 
right? But no one is studying the variables, as far as I can tell, as to what makes that churn happen. They're just trying to kind of get their hand around how, hands around how fast it happens. Um, we classify anomalies, so things that are unusual, differently from suspect. This is actually something that the, that the industry is, is really bad with, um, because not all anomalies are created equal. Some anomalies are actually good anomalies. Um, but you, know, if you, you have to be able to understand, you know, not only something is unusual, but it's actively suspicious and, and classify it separately. And then keep in mind that all this intelligence is absolutely useless unless somebody does something about it. I heard a speaker yesterday talking about, you know, uh, actually Frank was talking about it in the keynote speech about how, you know, they had found the things that needed to happen, but they never got fixed. And so the, 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 the breaches keep happening over and over and over again. Um, a lot of these guys, think about it from a publisher's perspective, they've got nine games. They've got nine separate sets of support tools, each one written by developers that are not support developers. They wrote some, sort of some bare bones support tools. And so a lot of times they, it's not like that they don't want to take action, they don't even know how to take action. Also, some realities of the gaming space. Um, games are incredibly sensitive to lag, which means that if you put a tool in the client or the server, you're probably dead on arrival because the game probably is going to introduce lag into the game. And any lag, it's just they're not going to deal with at all. They don't want to deal with it at all. Um, they hate, hate, hate the overhead. Uh, games that are uh, healthy and making money are constantly updated. So the developers are changing the environment on purpose all the time. Which means that not only does that make the rules harder, but it also makes analytics harder. So anything that adds overhead to their already expensive development cycle is going to not get you in the door. Um, and you know that that constant change can't be overstated enough because you know, unlike a banking system where you know it doesn't change very often, um, games you know change for a living, and it makes it uh, a unique challenge, uh, especially for uh, an analytics company. Uh, going to talk real quick about anomaly detection, and then and then I'll open up for questions. Um, you know, obviously, anomaly detection is the identification of events that are unusual. Um, and we talked about the difference between that and like a suspect. Um, we talked a little bit about rules, you know, already. Um, the main thing about rules is that they're reactive. I mean, something pretty much has to be observed first before they can create a rule around it, which is why we, like. we don't like them. And then you know, we hear this over and over again, you know. Um, every publisher we talk to tells us that they've got the right assets, the right people. They just don't know what to look at. Um, you know, they're looking at lists of things hundreds long, and they don't know which ones to take action on. Uh, this is, you know, our product that actually does this, but I'm not going to go into that very much, uh, because anyone who is interested in that can look on our website. I do want to open this up for questions while we still have a few minutes, you know, before we break out. So thanks very much, everybody. I hope that was informative to people, and I'm going to open it up for questions. Does anybody have any questions on this? Yeah. You mentioned that you talked to the uh, keynote speaker yesterday. Was he even aware? that this is a type of fraud? He seemed like he was, but you know, when I asked him what the FBI was sort of, you know, doing about it or what they're interested in doing about it, and I said there was this sort of like, he, I don't think he really understood why I was even asking him the question. And I think that a lot, a lot of that has to do with, you know, sort of the little clip we played at first. Right? They think, no, there's really not much at stake, right? These are just play, this is just play money, and it's just play assets, right? Um, but, you know, I, I can guarantee you that the people that make a living writing and publishing these games, it's a huge deal. For them, and it does, you know, it does cost jobs and it does cost livelihoods. So. Any other questions? All right, great. Well, my contact information is there if anybody thinks of anything. Uh, I'm also, I, I should put my Twitter on here. It's Panopticon Matt, if anybody uh, is on Twitter. So uh, thanks very much, everybody. Enjoy the rest of the show, and, uh, and uh, thanks for watching. See you.